in the Russian Civil War from 1918 to 1921, probably 150,000 Jews are killed, villagers, civilians, by all the different armies in that war. All you know, doesn't matter if you were a communist or a white Russian or any of the different groups, Ukrainian nationalists, you come across a Jewish village, you burn it to the ground. And over the course of that period, 1880 to about 1921, um, millions of Jews flee Europe. And almost all of them flee to the West, to the United States. There's almost no reason to flee to Ottoman or then British Palestine. Um, and they so they flee westward, a little bit to Britain, Canada, a little bit to Brazil, Argentina, almost two and a half million to the United States. Most of American Jews today are those Jews. The vast majority of American Jews are, the, are that flight in those 40 years. In 1921, the U.S. Congress passes a law of a, the, the Emergency Quota Act, it's called. And the Emergency Quota Act essentially shuts the doors of America to the Jews. So in 1921, I think 140,000 Jews land in New York. And by 1924, when there's an even stricter quota act passed, it's down to 10,000. And by 1934, uh, when the Nazis are already in power in Germany, it's down to 2,700. And so the, the gates close from America after, and it has many reasons. Some of it is just prejudice. Uh, some of it is uh, the depression. Uh, there, there are many different sort of pressures. Uh, after America, Canada does the same. Britain uh, shuts its doors. France, Argentina, Brazil, Australia, you name it, they shut their doors to the Jews. And so in Europe, in the 1930s, Poland starts taking citizenship away from Jews. In the 1920s, Romania kicks Jews out of universities. Everything that we know of, of the Nazis, of how the Nazis treated Jews, the Nuremberg laws and things like that, well, you know, it six, uh, what was it, 50 years, 1882, the Russian Tsar passes the May Laws, which kicks Jews out of universities and professions in parts of Russia. Um, Jews are living in a place that is becoming uninhabitable. And along comes a, a continent. I mean, Europe makes itself literally uninhabitable for Jews. And all Europe, all countries, every single government, uh, in different ways at different times, but all of them. And that is the world into which the Zionist movement is born. And along come people like Theodore Herzl, an, a Viennese Jew. Uh, in, in 1897, uh, he gathers together the, what's called the First Zionist Congress. He publishes a book called The Jewish State. And he makes a very sp specific argument. We're going into this modern times, right? We're having this, you know, there's new liberalism. All, all these different countries have parliaments. Suddenly we're, we're, we're developing science that we never developed before. Somebody figured out that the electron is negatively charged. There's all this magical stuff happening. Modernity is happening. But I'm telling you, Jews, that inside this modernity and inside this parliamentarism and liberalism, there are murderous impulses. He says there is a catastrophe coming. He even says, I don't know how it will happen. I don't know if they'll come for us from below by which he means Marxists, or if they'll come for us from above, by which he means the European elites. I don't know if they'll rob us, if they'll kill us, if they'll expel us. I suspect it'll be all these things at once. Theodor Herzl tells the Jews of Europe, if you don't get out, you will face a catastrophe. And that's the birth of the Zionist movement, finding a way to get the Jews out. And as the gates close, the Jews begin in their hundreds of thousands. First, it's a trickle after 1881. By 1921, when the doors of the West close, it becomes a flood. The Jews flee to the land of Israel. And that's the Jewish story. And it's a powerful story. I want to, I'm sorry to talk so long, but just, you know, um, on the other side of that story, um, even everybody knows about the Holocaust, so I don't have to talk about it. But Americans don't know about after the Holocaust, because the quotas weren't lifted after the Holocaust. And so even though the American story is that the troops liberated Bergen-Belsen, Bergen-Belsen still had Jews living behind barbed wire, kept in by force, patrolled by British and American troops until 1947. They still couldn't go and no government on earth would take them. When did the DP camps of Europe and their quarter million Jews empty? In 1948. And in that 48 war at the establishment of the state of Israel, one quarter of the soldiers of the IDF, at the moment the IDF was established, were Holocaust refugees, were DPs, displaced persons. That's our story. And I told you our story so that we could flip to the Palestinian story. The Palestinians from day one, and I mean 1881, the Arab elites of Jerusalem, of Beirut, the idea of exactly what Palestine is, what part of the land counts as Palestine is something that changes and morphs a little bit. Beirut counts as part of it at the time. But they see this beginning of this Jewish influx, and they interpret it in a very different way. 
they say it's not that these Jews are refugees fleeing the czar. They all spoke Russian, these Jews, because they're running away from Russian lands. These Jews, in fact, are agents of the czar. The Russian Empire is the great enemy of the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs in the Middle East believe they're Ottomans at the time, and so these enemies are coming. Um, and then over the 1920s and 30s, um, as these big colonialist projects really take root in Algeria and in Kenya and places like that, um, they begin to look at us and say, oh, these are European colonialists, right? Um, in 1935, 65,000 Jews land here for, who, who speak German. You'll never guess why, right? Um, Palestinians interpret that. And there's writings of the Palestinians interpreting these German-speaking Jews who begin to come in the 20s and more in the 30s as a German invasion. And so they have a story about us that isn't our story. Our story is that we're refugees. Their story about us is that we are European invaders and colonialists. And what do you do with invaders and colonialists? And this will bring us right till today. And I apologize for how long this took. When you have invaders and colonialists, you do what the National Liberation Front of Algeria did to the French in Algeria. You murder them. You murder their children. You terrorize them. And the French, who were in Algeria for 130 years, flee that terror wave. A million and a half white French Europeans in 1962 all run away. The British in 1960 flee Kenya after the Mau Mau uprising. And so there has been a Palestinian terror war on us that assumes that we are European colonialists. For a century, the first serious Palestinian uh, terrorism against the Jews begins in 1920. We're now in 2023. And it never works. And they don't understand why it never works. And so the, the logic of the internal discourse of the Palestinians is, what if we just do it more? Every time you see a college kid scream on an American college campus, this is decolonization. You're allowed to kill women and children. It's decolonization. What they mean is, if I terrorize the French colonialists in Algeria, they'll leave. So these are French colonialists in Algeria. I terrorize them and they'll leave. What's the problem with that? I have no France. That's what just happened. It's what happened 20 years ago in the Second Intifada with 140 suicide bombings that shattered the peace process. It's what happened time after time after time, airplane hijackings and terror attacks. And you don't have to think Israel's good. You don't have to like Israel. You can hate Israel. But you do need to understand that we are a refugee people with nowhere to go. So we're immune to terrorism. And the Palestinians resort to the kind of terrorism that Hamas showed us on Saturday. It's 100 years of that. And it's never going to work because we have nowhere to go. Yeah. How do things shift in uh, after 1948? I mean, essentially, Israel has been at war in one shape, way, shape or form, maybe not uh, declared since its inception, it seems. After 1948, everything I just said about Europe becomes true about the Arab world. Israel's Jewish population more than doubles in four years. Uh, when Israel was established in 48, I think there were 650 or 700,000 Jews. And then the Jews begin to flee the Arab world en masse. In 1930, 25% of Baghdad is Jewish. I bet most of your listeners didn't know that. Oh. Um, more than New York City. By 1952, 0% of Baghdad is Jewish. Every last Baghdadi Jew is in Israel. They are fleeing. They're fleeing um, essentially a pro-Nazi regime of Rashid Ali. You know, Look it up on Wikipedia, folks fascinating history. They're fleeing pogroms. They're fleeing literally Nazi established, I mean, by the Nazi embassy in Baghdad, youth movements. Um, because they were anti-British, they joined with the Nazis in World War II. And the effect culturally on Iraq, that alliance with the Nazis in World War II was profound. And the Jews flee. The Jews of Yemen, the Jews of Egypt, the Jews of Syria, half the Jews of Israel. We don't think the way you, uh, the way Americans think in terms of categories of race. We, we still have problems and divides and marginalization, every problem you can imagine. It's just not along racial lines. But in American terms, the, half the Jews of Israel come from the Arab world. They're brown. They're not white, which is, again, something that doesn't enter the discourse about us. We come from the Arab world, half of us, one in two. And, and that's the story of the Jews of after 48. The, the Jewish population of Israel expands massively as all these Jewish populations run away from an Arab world that essentially kicks them out and terrorizes them. Um, and the story of the Palestinians really kind of fades away uh, because after the 48 war, of course, who's, who ends up in charge of the West Bank and Gaza? Egypt is ruling Gaza and Jordan is ruling the West Bank. Um, by the way, in military occupation, the world never recognizes Jordanian control of the West Bank. 
And then comes 19 years later, the 67 war. The Six Day War is a war uh, that we know is going to be a war. We know ahead of time. The Egyptians put a naval blockade on us. That's one hint. Um, they declare uh, that they're going to, the Egyptian radio says, we're coming for you. We're going to kill you. Uh, there are 10,000, 13,000, uh, excuse me. There are 13,000 mass graves dug in the middle of Tel Aviv, in Yarkon Park in Tel Aviv. Israelis are expecting a war. And then, and they don't yet know that they're powerful, right? We have no technological edge over the Arabs in 1967. We have pretty good French planes. The Soviet, the Arabs have pretty good Soviet planes. There's no technological edge. And then we have this spectacular victory in which we end up also in charge of the West Bank and Gaza for the first time. And that begins the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. It's really important to understand that the Palestinian strategy of terrorizing us, the founding of the PLO, doesn't happen in 1967 when we conquer the West Bank and Gaza. It begins in 1964. The PLO is founded before Israel's in control of the West Bank and Gaza. It is founded on the model of the Algerian FLN. The FLN kicks the French out in 62 with eight years of terrorism. The Palestinians look at that and say, hey, we figured out how to kick white people out of our country. And it founds its own National Liberation Front, which it calls the Palestine Liberation Organization, and begins to carry out terror attacks against Israelis. And that is before there is an occupation in the West Bank or Gaza. All of this escalates over the, you know, the 70s. There are famous airplane hijackings, uh, terror attacks in the 80s and the 70s. There's the killing of the Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. Um, these terror attacks escalate and escalate and escalate. There's then the Lebanon War, which is a war against Palestinian terror groups in Lebanon in 1982, after they had carried out dozens of horrifying terror attacks from Lebanon. Um, that history continues right up until 1992. The peace process begins in 1992. Uh, Itzhak Rabin, Israeli Prime Minister, and Yasser Arafat go to Oslo. They begin to sign agreements. They establish Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank. Uh, Israeli soldiers pull out of the Palestinian cities. Um, and, um, you know, they're negotiating a final status, uh, uh, what to do about, you know, dividing Jerusalem, uh, how to bring back refugees, where they go, uh, what the borders are going to be, all of the big complicated issues of Palestinian statehood. And then in, in the middle of those negotiations or during a rough period in those negotiations where the negotiations break up, um, a massive wave, beginning in September of 2000, a massive wave of 140 suicide bombings smashes Israel's cities, um, one after another for three years. It's a wave of suicide bombings from which Israel never recovers. The Israeli left never recovers. If you visit Israel, in some ways you will be walking around in a very happy country. We have the GDP per capita of New Zealand, so, you know, I think their main export is sheep, right? It's not America rich, but it is comfortable Western democracy rich. In other ways, you'll be walking around in a country that is still living in the post-traumatic shadow of that of those 140 suicide bombings. These are suicide bombings that targeted children. They were on buses. Um, many Israeli cities don't have school buses. So a 7.30 a.m. city bus blowing up is, a, is essentially a school bus. Um, I... Every Israeli family knows someone from that second intifada in 2000 to 2003. Um, and there have been these ways, these terror wars, the second Lebanon war in 2006, where tens of thousands of rockets fall on Israeli cities. We didn't yet have Iron Dome. We didn't yet have enough bomb shelters. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis flee their homes. I'll stop with the whole litany. You know, we're very happy people. <laughs> <laughs> that well, that's that strategy and that vision of history and that history of Israeli trauma all came to a head on Saturday. Hamas just managed to pull off the greatest massacre of Jews since 1945. And for us Israelis, what does Israel meant? For us Israelis who came out of a world that could not stomach us, that spat us out or literally murdered us, Israel is the point, Israel is the moment where Jews stop dying. This is an important thing to understand, especially for English speakers, you know, Americans, Canadians. We're not American Jews. We're the other Jews. 
American Jews get into America by 1921 and spend the next 100 years discovering the promise of liberalism come true. They didn't go through the 20th century. And so they became liberals and they fell in love with that liberalism. And that makes perfect sense. They're, they're right. They're not wrong in America. But Israeli Jews are the Jews who had to, had to go through that 20th century. And they built a state and they built an army and they decided that you don't get rescued. You rescue yourself. You don't get emancipated. You emancipate yourself. And so our reaction to those thousand dead isn't anger. It isn't vengeance. Something much deeper is happening to my country over the last five days. Our own promise was broken to, to those kids who were massacred. We didn't fulfill the essence of our existence, which is to defend each other. And so the Israel that is now going to war in Gaza is going to war to make sure it never happens again. If Hamas survives this, we will again have violated the founding promise. We will have violated who we are. It's your fault for telling me to talk and being too polite to stop me. Yeah. Well, uh, I have, I mean, I have so many, so many questions and I sincerely appreciate you taking this time. Um, going back to the founding of Hamas, what was the impetus for the founding of Hamas and, uh, and then the differences between that and the Palestinian authority in, uh, from the eighties up to, let's say 2006, when they began to, to self-govern or were elected, um, in Gaza? Sure. Uh, the, the two major Palestinian factions are Fatah which controls the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. There are a few other factions, but uh, essentially Fatah is a, is a nationalist movement. It is very religious, but it's technically secular, but they're all very, very religious. Um, but it's a nationalist movement that, wants, that very much modeled on Algerian and other Arab nationalist movements uh, that wants to establish a Palestinian state um, for many decades, you know, instead of Israel, after the Oslo years or during the Oslo years, since then it's kind of changed. It, it you know, depending on which Fatah person you ask, you get a different answer. But, um, but you know, alongside Israel or maybe replacing Israel. But it is the party that went to the Oslo peace process, and it is in control of the PLO and of the Palestinian Authority, and it sits in the West Bank. Uh, 